Welcome to the show, Bob. Great to have you. Uh, it's great to see you, AJ. We would love to hear what inspired the Friction Project. Well, a lot of frustration inspired the Friction Project. Just going nuts. So uh, my co-conspirator, Huggy Rao and I, we uh, published a book in 2014 called Scaling Up Excellence. And there are these, all these companies, well, Salesforce, Facebook, Google, they wanted to scale, baby, scale. They scaled and it was like, look what I've done to myself. There's all these people. There's all these procedures. There's all this complexity. I feel like I'm walking in muck. It's really hard to get things done. And there was this one woman who said to, to Huggy when we teach executives, and she said, uh, they keep saying they want me to show initiative and will and creativity. And every day I just feel like, how am I supposed to do that? That, that was the kind of thing that got us going. Also in our own university, our own employer, since I've been here, I've been here 40 years. I'm an old fart. Uh, it's gotten harder and harder to get things done. It actually turns out that at Stanford, we seem to have about the same number of administrators as we do um, students, more or less. It's within a couple hundred. And I, I love every administrator I've ever met individually, but collectively, they unwittingly just add more and more stuff for us to do and they keep each other busy. You know, it's, you know, the old joke, if a town's got one lawyer, they're broke. If a town has two lawyers, they're rich because they just spend all the time suing each other. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so, so that was the, that was got, and I can get to the good news, but it started out of fric, out of friction and in, in, in frustration. But uh, there's, there's actually a lot of good news in the book. And I, I became more optimistic as this adventure unfolded. That was the good news. So this, bring, this book brings up a lot of great points for entrepreneurs and people who are in business. But there's another aspect to this book that is, that is unique to this podcast, which is that those same frictions, if they enter into personal relationships make them daunting and complex and makes people want to quit. And then uh, uh, when it becomes difficult to hang out with somebody, we opt out of spending time with them. When it's easy to hang out with people, then we're going to opt to hang out with those people more. And if we are looking around and we're asking ourselves, you know, I ask people to hang out. I ask people to do stuff. No one returns my texts. I don't know what's going on. Well, I think the first thing that you should be asking yourself is, are you putting in friction for people to hang out with you? Are you making it hard for them to say yes? Yes. Well, well I, I, I think, you know, I, I don't think that bosses and personal relationships are, <laughs> or work colleagues are all exactly the same, but I think you are getting on some interesting parallels and I think this is perilous error for me. Like I'm an organizational psychologist. Like, like you should never go to me for dating advice. Ask my adult children. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, but in in my in my in personal relationships, that yes, to me, there's at least three kinds of people that I tend to avoid. To be honest, like people, and that's a certain cor- sort of friction because they leave you feeling bad. Yes. And that, the people who you just can't get out of your head, ugh, those are the people I don't want to. I don't want to hang out with. Um, then there's the people who mean really well, but they make everything so complicated. They give you a list of forty-seven things to do, and then and then they also micromanage you and criticize you because you're not doing as well in the process. This this could be anything from getting organized to having sex. I mean, it's like you know, there's some people that are kind of, you know, a different kind of friction. And, and then there's and then there's people who are just boring. So, <laughs> so that's my yeah. sort of quick theory. <laughs> and I think it's important that we look at ourselves. And part of this book for me was raising self awareness because I think we've all experienced friction on the other end. And we hate it, we avoid it, we talk bad about that person, we try not to get involved in projects with them, but we often don't look at ourselves and potentially the friction that we're causing others, whether it's personal or professional. So what can we do to raise our own self-awareness around friction that we're bringing? So that's a beautiful statement. And the way that we described in the book is that uh, all of us have sort of a cone of friction 
that we have the opportunity to make life better or worse for everybody who we touch in, 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 in the workplace. I mean, we talk about everybody from Satya Nadella, who is the CEO of Microsoft, who, who really did a whole bunch of things to get rid of uh, really uh, destructive relationships because they had, they had a reward system and, and a culture where you got ahead by treating other people like dirt and, and not cooperating with them. And he changed the whole reward system. So that's, get, that's at the very top. And then my favorite example is, so what state are you guys in right now, uh, the United States? I'm in Colombia, California. Yeah, oh, good, me too. Okay, so so one of my favorite uh, experiences in doing the bill, book is I went to the California DMV to re-register my, my mother. <laughs> Talk Toyota, about friction. And I, th- I, and I thought I was, <laughs> it was going to be hell. So I get there at 6 in the morning, the 7.30 in the morning, and there's 60 people in line, and it's like, Okay, if I'm out of here by eleven, I just like I'm at peace. It's it's gonna suck. And then at seven forty, this guy, this really nice guy, nice DMV, nice, walks down the line, asks each of us what we're doing there. Some people, he says, no, you can't get a passport here. You're wasting your time. Other people, here's a form. You don't have to wait in line. Just fill it out right now and give it to me. He gave me my form. I filled it out. He told me what window to go to. Everybody was nice, and I was done by 8.15. I was so confused. And then, so now, Huggy and I are doing a case study with the people who run the California DMV, and they're dedicated to making our experiences better as, as citizens. Just for example, there's something called a real ID that everybody in California is going to have to get yep. eventually. They have it, and they're doing time and motion studies. They have it down from the time you get to the office to you leave because you have to have a wet signature. Up from, down from 28 to 8 minutes. Uh, so I'm talking to a Google executive last week. Google has really serious – because pro- they've gotten so big. They have so many processes. They have so many fiefdoms. They, ha- they actually have a lot of friction problems. So <laughs> I said to her, if the DMV can fix themselves, you can fix yourself. <laughs> so, so you know, everybody's <laughs> always saying Silicon Valley, it's a, s- a solution to everything. Now my motto is if only the if only these big bureaucracies in the Silicon Valley that, you know, this is like they scaled, maybe scaled. Uh, they they need to learn from the DMV. So, so that's my motto. <laughs> <laughs> And the DMV really, I was really impressed with them. Yeah, I'm shocked. It's shocking to hear, to be honest. Uh, I'm still I try shocked. to avoid it as much as possible. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, but, 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 but that actually, that's one of the things that helps is I think that we all try to avoid it. It actually reduces the load on them in some ways, too. But, uh, but they, they really are making progress and they really are citizen centric and they're using technology and they're working on their culture to have the people be a little bit you know, more civilized or less uncivilized. They're working on all that sort of stuff. Obviously, the DMV was friction full, <laughs> looked at themselves, made some improvements. So if we look at ourselves, how do we recognize that we're causing friction on others? And what can we do to remove the friction that we may be causing on others? Ooh, I like that. So so this, this is this notion, and this is true for all other kinds of organizational change too, is that if you just point fingers at other people and say, I'm not the problem you are, it doesn't work because 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 what happens is it becomes an orphan problem and, and 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 it's all about blame and yes and like I'm I'm as happy to do recreational bitching as much as the next person, but when the stuff actually gets fixed, it's when everybody takes it upon themselves to fix it. So what one of the examples uh, that we have in the book, and we've been in touch with the this doctor. There's a doctor named Melinda Ashton. Uh, she's at Hawaii Pacific. It's the largest healthcare system in Hawaii, and we all know. I don't know about in Colombia, but in the in much of the rest of the world, when you go to the doctor, instead of looking you in the eye, they just look at the screen of the, the electronic health records. We've probably all had this experience. And and so that's the electronic health records add a lot of friction to the healthcare experience. But rather than saying, oh, we have to throw the whole things out, out what she did was she ran a, a sort of a, a change effort called getting rid of stupid stuff. That, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, Getting Rid of Stupid Stuff. And she had everybody go through who was part of the system and make suggestions about ways they could subtract sources of unneeded friction. And usually that was steps. So just for example, they they got rid of uh, one of the steps that uh, every nurse and nurse assistant was required to uh, make when they did rounds. And that got rid of 24 seconds for each visit. And this ended up being like something like a thousand hours a month in the whole system. 
And to me, that's a pretty good model of rather than just complaining about it and pointing fingers, we all work together to find the the problems. And then there was a group who had the power to implement the solutions. And, and that's the opposite of it's a simple example, but that's the opposite of teaching it, of treating it as an orphan problem. And it's also a sign that, uh, gee, I, I have some stories about things that get fixed suddenly and all at once. Uh, but in real life, this is, it's like a discipline. It's like, no, like exercising once doesn't seem to work. If you do it once a year, it doesn't seem to work. You get, you, you got to do it as part of a discipline. Well, that brings up an interesting concept that you have in the book, which is chicken effers and hollow Easter bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> can, can can I use the word fuckers in this? Am I allowed? Absolutely. I don't know. I don't, You're allowed. <laughs> so so this comes from my friend Becky Margiad and Becky, she's t- she went she went to West Point was when she went to West Point a long time ago and she was one of the only women there. She was she's like five one and you know it, 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 and I love when I talk to Becky is it talk about friction the way she said she got through the hazing at West Point when she was a first year she said. My view was that the upperclassmen who were taunting me were just really funny. So I'd mostly get in trouble for laughing at them. So that's Becky. Um, anyhow, so she goes through her military service, and, 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 and then she look, is looking for something to do after. She's in the military, is, is a captain for seven or eight years. And uh, she gets involved in the homelessness um, problem, which is very serious, of course, in the United States. Eventually, she led a campaign that found homes for 100,000 homeless um, Americans and has done all this stuff. But one of the things that she learned in the military was that when something went wrong, and and she has a story that she kind of wakes up her commanding officer at um, three in the morning, and she looks at Becky blearily, and Becky describes the problem, and the commanding officer says, well, who's fucking this chicken? Which is apparently military speak for who is in charge of fixing this thing. And so then fast forward to the 100,000 Homes campaign that Becky and her team was trying to get people all over the country to actually find homes for homeless people, because that was her definition of success. Homeless person, put them in a home, that counts as one. So, uh, And there were some folks where people would just talk and talk and talk and talk and do nothing. She called them hollow Easter bunnies. You know, the kind of the people, the, the, the worst, the people who use talk as a substitute for action, they're bullshitters. And she started giving this little speech about who's fucking this chicken. And people love that speech. And so they st- so they gave this award to people who actually got stuff done, which was – they and they gave him a little tin um, chicken, a rooster actually, because <laughs> that's what fucks with chicken is a rooster, right? Sure. That's my understanding of how these things work. And uh, so anyway, so, so that's, that's Becky. And Becky is totally a character. I mean uh, – and, and now she's helping other uh, large nonprofits – uh, like the Gates Foundation with other sorts of large scale change. But that's Becky. And, and, and so, and, and the lesson in sort of in without the obscenities is that in, in organizations that are good at fixing friction, uh, rather than using talk as a substitute for action, so the bullshit, the plans, the meetings, the speeches, the training, which is all nice and it does motivate action, but when it becomes a substitute for actually doing stuff, that's when we start having a red a red flag that we're you know just uh, spewing out nonsense and not actually getting stuff done. I remember having a, a, a we had an employee who always wanted to have the meeting after the meeting to discuss the meeting, and we're like, well, well, well we just I don't, and I'm like looking at him like, how do you think that this is rational or, or or going to help us move forward? But this brings up a very good point. I would think in some of these companies where there are so many employees, there are people who are causing messes. So they have something to do or something to talk about or to have a meeting about so they can actually get a chicken fucker to come fix the thing that they are the mess that they are well, making. Well, well, yeah, yes, yeah. Well, so, 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 so we, we, the, the general disease we call this addition sickness, and uh, we have a chapter on addition sickness, and and in general, there's a bunch of academic psychological research that show that we human beings naturally are wired to solve problems by adding rather than subtracting complexity. That, that that's standard, um, but then organizations reward people who do that too. And and the classic thing that I'm just thinking of you describing the person I can and I have the picture in my I mind. I think all of, of us have this Stanford person bureaucrat. <laughs> um, and, and but what happens is it, with addition sickness in a place like Stanford University or Google, same problem right now, is that if you want to get paid more, you build the biggest possible fiefdom 
of people, let's just say, who are bean counters. Let's just use this as an example. And when they're bean counters, like what happened? The more of them there are, like the more work they're going to create for one another and for you. Because I'm, obviously, whenever I submit my expenses, I always do something wrong or I go a dollar fifty over some category I never heard of. So therefore, we it has to go back four times. And so, so th- this idea about uh, about bureaucracies creating work for one another is one of the problems. And, but but to be optimistic, you know, we've been bitching a lot, and I, I do love bitching. But to be optimistic, there are organizations where this is just intolerable. Uh, where people who waste people's time and waste people's money, they, they actually are not glorified. Um, and, and two that I would pick, actually three, one is Walmart. And Walmart is like whatever, you know, it is so tightly ran. It is just amazing. I mean, they, they are, maybe they should pay their employees a little bit more, but I'm talking about the bottom. But my God, they are so efficient about not wasting people's t- time. They have, they have a very sort of simple structure. And they're the largest private employer in the United States. They only have eight hierarchical levels. I mean, that's kind of amazing. Uh, I think Google has probably like 29 or something. I'm probably making this up. But um, there are organizations that do this well. Also, Apple, which is very good about not overhiring people or overloading people. And uh, in Amazon too, those are some of the ones I know that actually find ways to to avoid unnecessary friction. And they're not perfect. Nothing's nobody's perfect. Well, to transition from the bitching, so I think for a lot of us, when we think about friction, it feels negative, right? We we don't want to slow down. We don't want friction in our lives. We want to be friction free and efficient and enjoying ourselves. But there are cases and instances where friction is actually a good thing. So let's speak about the positives of friction. See, so the, I love that question. The analogy that that I've been using lately, and, I, and this feels right, is so if you like, you're a NASCAR or a Formula One f- fan. The people who win the races are not the people who put the pedal to the metal and never take it off. Because if you do that, well, you, you don't make it around the first turn. You got to hit the brakes, and then you do have to take a pit stop occasionally to sort of recharge. Even so, if you use that as as sort of as sort of um, analogy, there's time when you need to hit the gas times when you need to hit the brake. The classic time when you need to hit the brakes, if you look at uh, the research we've done and the behavioral sciences in general, are when um, you don't know what to do, so you're really confused. That's a situation, you know, as long as the plane's not crashing or the patient's not squirting blood like crazy, uh, that's, that's a point where you kind of got to slow down and figure out what to do before you do something stupid. So, so, so that, and we have lots of examples of startups. Uh, one is Waze, where the CEO sort of figured out, let's stop hiring. Uh, let's stop doing any product development. Let's just take a few weeks and figure out what's going on. And Waze is a good example. They did that for six weeks and then they hit the gas after they figured it out and started hiring, doing more product development. Uh, so, so that's one part. And another thing, which I really got interested in recently is there's some interesting uh, studies out of Germany that where they there's old studies that showed that the higher people's IQs are, the faster they solve problems. This turns out to not be quite right. The new research shows that really smart people solve simple problems quickly, but complex problems more slowly because they fi- they slow down to figure out what the hell's going on and glue all the complexity together. And in the analogy we have for organizational life is if it's a really complicated problem, like a quick, easy fix probably isn't going to work. So that's two. And then I'll throw in one more and then see what else we want to talk about is, uh, I, and, and I love talking to John about being in Colombia. You actually just, you just sort of lived this, this notion. Uh, there's this really cool research on this notion of savoring. So it's the notion that, uh, so, you know, there's research on coping, which is, oh, things are terrible. How do I avoid having them ruin my life? But savoring is people with good mental health, they slow down and they enjoy the good stuff in life. They, they pause to reflect about what's wonderful or to anticipate, they maybe spend a few minutes saying, oh, oh, dinner is just going to be great tonight rather than just rushing to dinner. So that's an, another thing that I think good leaders do is they get people to slow down to appreciate whatever that whatever they're doing and to take pride in their work. So that that's the 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 other sort of part of adding some friction that we've gotten pretty obsessed with lately. So friction is something that a lot of us are like, ah, avoid, let's try to become more efficient, but sometimes 
without that friction, we can make the wrong decision, misguided decisions. And you have a great example of Google Glasses. So I know about 10 years ago, I was at a music festival and saw this guy walking around with this device on his eyes and kind of pointed and laughed with my friends. And of course, it became a big joke in Silicon Valley. But this was something that was near and dear to Sergey Brin's heart. Like he wanted this thing to be the future and moved fast, took all Google's resources and threw it at this problem without any friction, and it was a major flop. It's kind of interesting because, you know, when I will give uh, my book to various people to read early, and one of the people I gave it to last week, and she, and she said, oh, this is just a great book, and then she writes me back, oh, shit, I was on the Google Glass team. Did you have to go after us? <laughs> <laughs> but what what happened, according to her report in the New York Times, but is is that... It's, it's a product development team, and this is consistent with the notion that creativity can take a long time and be messy, and it's hard to rush creativity too much. But what happened is, um, is, is the team didn't think it was ready, but there's this old thing of uh, don't show stupid people unfinished work. And I'm not saying that uh, what Sergey Brin is generally stupid, but I think he had a moment of stupidity and possibly arrogance here. And, and he got overly excited with this product, and they were like, no, 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 it's not ready. Yeah, yeah, it is. And he ripped it out of their hands. And the rest is history. It was total failure. Um, so that's that's something where you have a when people have too much power and not enough friction stopping them, it can be a problem. So is there an equilibrium? You know, we talked a lot about bureaucracies and things growing at such a scale where we're just creating busy work. Is there a lean mindset that we should take, and is there too lean where we remove all friction and then get those negative results? I, I like that. In some ways, that's a great question. So the question is, what's the sort of optimal one? I don't know whether this is to be self-critical or realistic, but I don't think that there's any management book or any how-to book on earth that you can just take it, read it, and then your life is cured. There might be, to me, what, what, what I tend to view a book like, like mine or almost any book that I read that I think is going to be useful, it, it's sort of like my life is a series of meals that I put together. And uh, gee, this might be a nice menu to help me assemble various meals. And and to me, that's how I think of it. And and I think it is presumptuous of me to tell uh, the leaders, managers, of uh, anybody who's ever had a job in this, to how to do their job because I can't know enough about it. Maybe some of the principles like adopting this subtraction mindset or slowing down to save your life; those those things might help you in specific instances. But well. I don't want to talk about it in too much detail, but you said a little technical problem. Um, I don't think my book could help you solve it. I think <laughs> I think that you had to figure it out with with your team. So I mean, but but to me, that's the classic sort of things that uh, that I don't want to overclaim. I think that what is an optimal equilibrium does help, and and some of the analogies help. One that really helps me a lot, which I've already said once, is this idea of. Uh, Think of yourself as is being a NASCAR or Formula One racer. You don't go full speed the entire time, and and even even like a, a friend of mine, oh a Andy Papathanasio, he used to head. He, he was like a pit crew head um, at Hendrix Motorsports, and then he was like the athletic director. They had like eight different pit crews, and he said what we figured out was the teams that tried to go the absolute fastest were not usually the best because what they do is they'd have four pit stops that were like five seconds, and then they'd have one that was 11 seconds. So what you want is consistency. So that's a case where he, he talks about more rhythm and pace rather than going completely pedal to the metal because you're, you're, when you're harried, you tend to make mistakes. But, that's, but, but I don't know the exact optimal amount of, of going slow versus uh, fast when it comes to a pit stop, but Andy, Andy does. <laughs> <laughs> So recognizing that a lot of this is to raise awareness both on the negative and the positive impacts of friction. So you can have these conversations with your team members. And as you're trying to solve problems, recognize that those two things can exist. We can move too fast and get negative results, or we can bog ourselves down being too slow and not have enough chicken efforts in place to help us move things forward. Yeah, I, I love that. And just as a little addendum, I would add in the most constructive, at least teams and organizations that I've been part of. When the problem gets solved, it's because people aren't just pointing fingers at others. They're taking a look in the mirror, which is we're back to self-awareness, which John has brought up. So when we look at ourselves and our career, a big part of our audience wants to accelerate things, wants to get promoted, wants to move into these leadership roles, but they might not be in a leadership role just yet. 
So they're feeling the friction, but they may not feel that they have much control over the friction. So what advice do you have for someone at that stage of their career where they're in a very friction-filled situation and they want to move up to leadership? What are some of the best things they can do to become a friction fixer and get that career success they're looking for? To me, there's two parts of that. That if you are on a team where you have colleagues and a boss who, when you go to them, when you do good things, even when you criticize them nicely and say, we can fix it, to me, that's the, that's the sign. If, if your boss is being receptive, then you're probably okay. But if you are in a situation, and this is kind of in some ways goes back to the no asshole rule, um, when I talk to my students who do well in their careers versus not so well, the ones who do well, if they're in good situations, they stay in them and they keep making them better. But uh, one of my favorite expressions is uh, quitting is underrated. And um, if you are in a situation, this isn't just about friction, I mean, uh, where uh, you give a real authentic sort of uh, effort and are trying to help and either you're being ignored or disrespected or uh, for doing it, then, gee, you might start looking for another job. So, so to me, a lot of it is picking your context. And I realize that many people, you know, they might be in a situation where it's harder to find a job and they, I'm not saying they should quit immediately, but uh, just every student I've had over years, the smart ones know when to leave. So recognizing that that environment and context is so key to your success and being a, a friction fixer or could create a lot of needless friction in your life and stress Part of that, to me, seems not only having the interview process and doing a great job, but then talking to your new potential team members about how do they handle friction on the team and, and how are those things seen by superiors so that if it's seen in a good light and there seems to be upward mobility tied to fixing friction, then that's a great place for you. But if it seems like the team is recognizing friction, can't do anything about it, then maybe we have an asshole boss on our hands and we don't want to put ourselves in that situation. Or, or they're just incompetent. And, and I, I would also add that uh, my, my wife was master of this during the years. She was a lawyer and stuff. That the best people often for finding out whether or not you want to work for that person is to talk to somebody who used to work for them because uh, they are more likely to tell you the truth. I, I have a couple friends who got fired by Elon Musk. I think they, they give you very accurate information about what it's like working for him, and it ain't pretty. Yeah, recognizing that oftentimes the reason people leave is because it is that situation that you don't want to be putting yourself in. Or they get fired for, for doing something constructive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's not seen well. Well, there's another aspect of that too, which all of these companies are going to have a particular culture. That culture either... Uh, has been set up because it, everything else was neglected and that's the culture that built around that neglection or it was intentional to build a specific culture that would induce a, a certain type of productivity that would serve that company very well. You're not going to be suited for all of those companies. And in the book, there's a wonderful example. I, I believe it was Google where the, the interview process eventually gotten so out of hand that people were going up to 20 some interviews um, and wondering what is going on, which is utterly ridiculous. Now, as somebody who is interviewing, you need to start to take notice that if you're on your 10th interview, <laughs> you might be wanting to look might at be a lot of friction. It might be a lot of friction, and it might not be the culture that you want to be entering in if you're looking for the fast track to leadership. Well, well so that, that example this is from <laughs> Laszlo Bach. He's the well, he was basically head of HR for about ten years at uh, at Google, and I've had him fact check this multiple times. And, and this is a to me a beautiful example of using good friction to get rid of bad friction. They had a tradition which actually made sense in the early days when they had a few hundred people. Of, they'd interview the hell out of people for both technical skill and, and are these the people we can grow a great company with? So it was actually, they were really, really picky in the early days and that made sense. But then it became a tradition that what is it, what got you here right. won't get you there. John, to your point, they were doing, uh, and I, I remember fact checking the first time for the Wall Street Journal, I said 5, 10, 12 interviews and Laszlo said 25 once. At 25 interviews, just imagine the scheduling for whoever is scheduling that and imagine the poor candidate. And so Lazo just put in this simple rule, if you need to do more than four interviews for a job candidate, you have to write me to get written approval. So that's friction. 
It's good friction that got rid of bad friction. And he said that the excessive use of interviews dropped almost immediately. Oh, I heard bad so so. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but that's a case where I, a little bit more mindfulness is also part of that, too. For the candidate's position, you know, Google's a very prestigious job. Not only does it have all these benefits and perks, but it can really set you up for a career success. So there's going to be a ton of candidates who are willing to do 27 interviews and never give that feedback and never quit. So internally for Google, they're like, well, we're still getting candidates showing up for the 26th interview. So where's the friction? So that was probably true when Google had about a thousand employees and was the coolest employer in Silicon Valley. But one of the reasons Laszlo had to put this rule in is, well, actually during that era, Facebook was the coolest um, employer. You know, everybody has their moment, the cool, coolest employer. And, you know, people would do two interviews and get a job at Facebook and they'd take it and they'd just leave the Google process. So, so that when you're, the, when you're the coolest kid on the block, you can get away with abusing people a little bit more, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the prestige covered up a lot of the friction yeah, internally. Yeah. So you mentioned this concept of power poisoning in the book. And I would love to unpack that for our audience and what we can do if we're experiencing that. I, this is one of the things that I've been studying in various guises for years. But there's all of this behavioral science evidence. I'll talk about two. One is a lot of times when people get in positions of power, they don't have to struggle with the little inconveniences that the rest of us do. Um, you know, at, at the top of like a giant bank or something, you might have your own private plane and all that sort of stuff. But it even might be little things like like we talk about uh, the moment, the notion that General Motors, that um, employees down to a fairly low level, they don't have to deal with the hassle of buying a car. So that's one thing is, is that, that one of the things that causes friction blindness is that when people get power, they don't understand the inconveniences that their customers and other employees go through. That's one thing. The other thing is there's a bunch of evidence that uh, when we get in positions of power, something happens to our brain. This guy, Dr. Keltner, who wrote the book called The Power Paradox, got it right here. Uh, he even has made the argument that when people get power, it's almost like they have, have brain damage. And what they do is they focus more on their own needs, less on the needs of others, and they act like the rules don't apply to them. And, and he's done all these studies where the fancier, the more expensive the car people um, drive, the less likely they are to let pedestrians go by at the, at the stopwalk, all, all this sort of crazy stuff. The danger when people are in power is they just they just don't pay much attention to what um, happens to people with less power. And there's also this thing, uh, and just think about a baboon in a troop, Okay. So uh, in a baboon troop or in any organization, uh, attention is devoted up the hierarchy. So in the baboon, they look at the alpha male every 20 or 30 seconds because that dude can really hurt him or really help him, right? And that's kind of like that. So the problem with power poisoning is we aren't as aware about how our actions impose friction on other people. And just the, the, the classic thing, and we start the book with this, the first paragraph is a senior Stanford administrator wrote um, a like 2,000 word email with a 7,000 word attachment and sent it to uh, 2,000 or so employees. And, and being the obnoxious, well, person I can be sometime, I started complaining to her boss when I sent her an edit and said, gee, uh, this could have been, a th let's do the math. Suppose this was only 1,000 words. Um, actually, it was 1,266 words, and I said it, should, it could have been uh, 600, and, and I don't know why we needed such a long attachment. And, and, and to me, that, that's that sort of awareness that when you're in a position of power, you don't actually know what's going on. And what, one of my favorite stupid examples in the book, I heard about this from uh, the executive assistant for a CEO of a Fortune 10 company. I don't know very many, but I ran into this woman once, and she told me the blueberry muffin story. Okay, so here's her boss. He... He goes to early meeting and he just says, casually, it's a breakfast meeting, where's the blueberry muffins? That's all he said. You know, he, and it was like small talk. Then for the rest of his life, everywhere he went, there was piles of blueberry <laughs> muffins Be, because in the, it was in the notes. Don't forget the blueberry muffins. Loves blueberry muffins. And to me, that's I, I, like, I just imagine all these poor caterers and assistants running around for years, just trying to find blueberry muffins when they were hard to get. And, and, and it does seem like blueberry brand or who knows what the heck's going on. But, but to me, that's an example that, that when people are in positions of power, they're in danger of being oblivious to 
the effects of their actions on others. So recognizing that self-awareness around, okay, I'm in this new position of power. My brain actually changes. My behavior and style of interaction changes. And there are all these downstream consequences that either structurally I'm just not aware of because my life has gotten a little bit easier. I can park closer to the building. I have a larger stipend. I can fly business. And also looking upward, right? So that assistant doesn't want to be in another room where there's no blueberry muffins because now her job is on the line. So what can we do to be the antidote to that power poisoning if we ourselves might now be in a new leadership role? So this is back to John's stuff on self-awareness, and there's lots of ways to get self-awareness. One, one of my favorite ones, and this is a, a CEO of a nonprofit that I worked with for a bit, and it's very successful, and she had this philosophy of, at least she said in every office she'd ever worked in, she also had ran a large law firm, so she had a lot of this too. She said, there's always one or two people who complain constantly are known gossips, and she said, uh, there's always going to be one. If you think you can get rid of one, you're living in a fool's paradise. And she said, so first of all, I, I become friends with that person so I can get the information from them and, and create psychological safety so they can complain to me. And then the other thing she said, which is more sneaky, is that if you become friends with that person, you can influence the gossip stream because <laughs> <laughs> they're your friend. But I like the idea. And then we have a whole bunch of other uh, standard stuff in the book that you've heard of. One, one classic one is to the extent you can like shadow employees or work along with employees and understand the journey that, that, that they're going through. We have an example of a high school principal from New York City. And uh, she was constantly saying, and this is friction, that why are all my students late? They're lazy. They gossip. They're smoking dope. I mean, all the, they're on their phones, all the stuff that happens in high school, right? And so she started uh, shadowing students. And she said, it wasn't their fault, it was our fault. And, and, and she, I remember her telling this story, it's in Chicago. And she said, so I followed this girl. She had a class in the basement. Her faculty member kept her two minutes late. She had three minutes to get up to the top floor, which was a seventh, seven story building. She had to like run up this, and she had to change her tampon. So this is like, it was no way she was going to make it. And, and so then, so then what the principal did, she said, well, we, we started cracking down on teachers who kept students late. So that's changing. And the other thing is we gave them seven minutes rather than five minutes, you know, to, to go between classes. And I thought that was a pretty good example of, of, of her thinking that it was a student's fault when in fact it was structural friction that was in the system. So it sounds like raising that awareness is, especially in a position of power, is ingratiating yourselves and creating that open line of communication with a, a potential gossiper or someone who has all the information, but also just putting yourself in other roles from time to time to, to sit in another seat and experience the friction from another angle or another view to bring your awareness to it. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's why very often sometimes the best leaders I'm thinking, uh, I bashed General Motors, so I'll say they were great, CEO Mary Barra. She's had every different, she, her last job was head of HR, but before that she was head of product development, before that she was head of manufacturing, and before that she ran a plant. So somebody like that who's a CEO, they're not just from finance, they know how the whole thing sort of glues together. And, and, I, and I think that those sort of people, um, it, it's, great, it's, it's great to be able to have empathy for other folks if you don't have their expertise. So I, I should not, you know, practice doing heart surgery tomorrow, for example, I'd kill people. But the idea of also having, having uh, people understanding how the organization as a whole works is really important. So in your research for this book, and it was a seven year project, was there anything that was really sort of you going in a preconceived notion around friction that shifted after doing these interviews and doing this research? If I would pick a preconceived notion uh, it was my bias that uh, when it comes to government, I, I had two biases. One was it was unfixable, and two, the people who worked there didn't care. And the more that I learned, actually the opposite is is true, at least in many cases. And I already talked to some about the Department of Motor Vehicles at Stanford and how much the employees care about making things better. And one of my favorite examples in the book, there's a, a nonprofit in Michigan called Sevilla, and uh the folks at Sevilla were very in, upset because there's it's a benefits form that two and a half million people in Michigan complete to get things like food, uh, financial assistance, uh, health insurance, and so forth. And it was a thousand questions long, 42 pages long. My favorite question was, when was your child conceived? And it was a really difficult form to fill out. And, and, and the folks at Sevilla 
what they did was they started working with the government, including the people who ran the agency, to fix the form. And the people who in the, in the agency were embarrassed about it. They actually just didn't quite know how to do it. And then they started working with uh, uh, citizens and they did a whole bunch of prototypes. And now if you fast forward, the same form, uh, it, it's been modified uh, massively. Your, you know, your audience can look it up. It's Project Reform. It's 80% shorter. And people make far fewer mistakes. It puts far less uh, administrative burden on the system. And that was a case where everybody wanted to work together to fix the form. And to me, uh, I, I, when I first heard, because I actually met the guy, Michael Brennan, who's a CEO of it before he started working on the form, he literally got on the ground and rolled out the form and said, I'm going to fix this. And I can say, who that? I just met him. Who the hell are you? You know, you meet somebody in three minutes, he's on his hands and knees, he's rolling out this thing. And, uh, it was one of those things where it actually was was uh, possible, both the optimism and the fact that government can change. And so the, I guess if the state of Michigan can do it, maybe the rest of us can do it too. So so that's a, that's some of the things that, that sort of changes. I felt, I felt better about the possibilities of fixing things because we started out very pessimistic in this project and we got more and more optimistic as it went on. Yeah, I think for us internally, one of the things that we've noticed, sort of two trends, the, the trend to automation and bringing more technology in with the hope of becoming more efficient and now adding AI into the mix. I think a lot of people have blind spots around friction with technology and how it interacts with team members. And obviously, we've talked about a lot of different factors in that. But I'm really curious your perspective around AI and how it might create or impact friction in an organization. Well, well what is it? I, I'm being very careful not to parade myself as an AI expert. Even the, the number of people I know who become instant AI experts is kind of cracking me up. I, I didn't know they knew anything about AI until three months ago. So, but, but I do try to hang out with people who I think are actual AI experts. And here's what they tell me. So there's, there's a woman I'm, I'm working with. Her name's Rebecca Hines. She's, uh, she's head of the Work Innovation Lab at Asana and is doing a bunch of research. And it, it, this has been going back for six or seven years about AI implementations. And the thing that she is finding about AI implementations, and this is like the racetrack analogy we're talking about again, is if you just throw the technology to people and, and say, if you don't start learning how to do it immediately, you're stupid. And this is happening in some organizations. I'm sorry, but it is. But, but, but if you take the time to work with them to both gain their acceptance and show them how it works and also to, to make your AI t tools so that rather than um, having them be confused about how to improve their jobs, that the AI tools are modified to actually become assistance for their jobs so the tools become better. So that's, that's where you sort of slow down both to have the iterative um, discussion between the people who do the work and the, and the, and the people who develop the AI tools and get their acceptance. That's where it seems to work. And by the way, uh, to say something good about Microsoft, Microsoft, despite you know all the sort of it seems like uh, AI tools have appeared immediately, they've been very conchy, very clear about moving slowly with open AI to bring it in at a speed that they believe will not overwhelm us as users, will not cause legal problems, will not cause ethical problems. And, and there is some tension between OpenAI and Microsoft that OpenAI wants to go faster than Microsoft, but I think it's a constructive tension. So to me, that's the thing that I'm thinking about, about um, AI is that I think if we do it with a little bit of awareness and, and knowing when to hit the gas and knowing when to hit the, the brakes, I think they're going to be pretty good. And, and this is straight out of Microsoft's strategy. This is something they're public about. And so I have some hope. Bob, we'd love to hear one key takeaway that you wish the readers and our audience would implement from the Friction Project. Well, if I, if we're, let's be really specific. My favorite method that's in the book, uh, and which was developed with the aforementioned uh, Rebecca Hines at the Asana Work Innovation Lab, is this meeting reset tool. Essentially, all that she did was have 60 Asana employees go through their standing meetings in their calendars and rate them in terms of how important they were and how much work they were. That was, and then it turned out that about 20% of their meetings were really a lot of work, but not very important. <laughs> so, so, and then she worked with them to eliminate some of them, to make them less frequent, to make them smaller, to replace them with emails. And the average employee saved about uh, four hours a month. 
and, and I don't think, and this is in Harvard Business Review and it's in our book and stuff, Yeah, you know, your audience can look it up. But to me, I think it's a pretty simple thing that I could do right now is I could just look at the standing meetings in my calendar and just sort of that I have in the next two months and just sort of rate them. And, and, and that might be just a little tool that might help them. Yeah, I think we'd all be happy to get four hours a month back yeah. out of meetings. <laughs> yeah, an hour a week. Thank you so much for joining us, Bob. This is a pleasure. And where can our audience find out more about you and the Friction Project and the work that you do? Uh, I think if you just go to bobsutton.net, which is my my website, you can find it. And, uh, you know, the book's on Amazon. It's a, it's a book that'll be everywhere. And uh, I think that's the main places to sort of go. Just bobsutton.net is where most of the major things about me are sort of hiding. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks so much. Thanks, John. Thanks, AJ.